this is one oh there's a uh, job fair coming on thursday so if you're looking for a job tune into this the zoom link is on my page it's thursday at 6 30. um what is the future for nft god only knows um, nft seems to be the absolute most biggest scam in cryptocurrency right now um I my my personal prediction my personal feeling is the NFTs will drop to zero very soon, but as far as I'm concerned, all cryptocurrencies should have dropped to zero. So whatever's holding them up, I don't understand it. Um, when you buy an NFT, you have absolutely nothing, <laughs> but the price might go up. So it's all foam and no beer. Um, but uh, that's what a lot of things are. This is the qubit the set of all possible numbers between zero and one. No, it is something more insane. A qubit is a quantum mechanical object in an uncertain state that mixes the state of zero and one. So it's sort of in both at once. Oh, uh, good. 152 and 126. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, that's good. Good. I'm glad you folks are happy. All right. So let's take a look at today's 126, and it is assembly language. So that's the main thing here. And so let's start talking about that. I think I have it open somewhere. Aha, here we go. So this is 32-bit uh, assembly language today, which is a pretty old stuff, but it is the heart of most things. Yeah, Schrodinger's cat, yeah. All right, Schrodinger's cat is the, uh, yeah, that's the uh, extension of a qubit, uh, where a cat is partially alive and partially dead. All right, so uh, we've been through this. If you have a piece of malware, basic static analysis, you just look at the executable without running it, and you find things like what language it's written in, what the strings are, what it imports from libraries, and general information like that. A dynamic analysis is where you run it on a machine and see what it does to that machine. And uh, good. And so the um, those are easy analysis techniques. But the next one is advanced static. And advanced static is where you look at the code and figure out what it does, which is what most people find the most difficult thing to do because this assembly language stuff is kind of hard to read. It takes a few tries to get used to it. So here's the general levels of abstraction used in computer programming. You have a high level language like Java or C or something where you write statements that look sort of like English like this. Then you compile them and they turn into binary machine code, which is the only thing that ever runs. Everything that really runs in your computer is just a bunch of these binary instructions. And the Malware analysts, they only get this compiled code. They don't have access to the source code. So, you know, let me refresh my Twitch. It's gone all blurry on me. All right. And then, if in order to make the machine code a little easier to analyze, you disassemble it back into this stuff called assembly language, which is not as easy to read as high-level language, but it's easier than reading the binary machine code. And so, uh, malware analysts needs to get some skill at reading assembly language. All right, so here's levels of abstraction. Um, you got the hardware, microcode, machine code, and various levels of languages. So the hardware itself is a circuit with a whole bunch of transistors on a large-scale integrated circuit, whatever they call the really big ones now, and it's really just a bunch of XOR, AND, OR, and NOT gates that take bits pairs of bits and they do some operation on them and then put them out. And uh, the hardware is pretty much just fixed. Microcode is the firmware that runs on specific hardware and that's for things like embedded devices. And uh, that's a real important area of um, reverse engineering and security, but it's not what this course is about. This course is about malware that runs on general purpose normal computers. And machine code is um, the assembly code you see. The machine code is, is the binary code that runs here. And it's got, um, so it's, this is a command that will tell the processor to do something like put a number in a register or put a number in memory somewhere, that sort of thing. All right, and when you compile a high level language, it gets put in machine code. Machine code is what runs. So low level languages are human readable versions of machine code, and that's assembly language with commands like push and pop and not for no operation, and move and jump. So that's what disassemblers create. And this is the highest level language that can be reliably recovered from malware in principle, although some decompilers actually try to build it back into 
readable com, um, high-level languages, and that's what Ghidra does. And Ida Pro will do that if you spend about $5,000 on the uh, optional modules. So high-level languages like C and C++ and Java and Visual Basic and Python are what programmers use because it saves them a whole lot of time to write in this efficient high-level language and let an automated compiler turn it into machine language so a normal programmer never touches assembler or machine language. They avoid it. They don't need to do it and everything would be much more difficult and slow if they went down to that level. So interpreted languages like Python are the highest level. I'm not sure Java is interpreted, but anyway, uh, .NET is partially, I see .NET and Java are partly compiled down to bytecode. These things are not compiled in machine code, they're translated into bytecode, and that's then run uh, one command at a time in a virtual machine, or a .NET runtime, they call it. So you go, th it's uh, even further from the fundamental uh, machine language instructions. Everything still runs in machine language, but this is just even a higher level of abstraction to make it easier for the programmer, and therefore it will run slower, but um, it's easier for the programmer. That's usually the primary consideration. So reverse engineering is the process of taking a binary executable and figuring out what it does somehow, even though you do not have the source code, which would be the normal way to find out what it does. So you turn it into assembly language with a disassembler, Ida Pro being the most popular example, and then you read that. So the assembly language um, comes in various versions for different processors. The one we're going to do in this class is almost all x86 code, which is the most common for malware. So it'll run on 32-bit and 64-bit machines, but 64-bit code is becoming popular. And there is some for ARM coming out now. And there's, uh, all right. So x86, this is the hardware of the x86 processor. You have the central processing unit, which has registers, and it has an arithmetic logic unit and a control unit. And it then communicates with RAM through a bus, just a bunch of parallel wires that move data very quickly, and through input-output devices like the mouse and keyboard over here. So that's the game here. And so the CPU, the control unit, fetches instructions from RAM using the instruction pointer to say which instruction to fetch. Then it prepares them. Um, and the arithmetic logic unit processes them, and it uses the registers to store things temporarily that you're only going to need for a brief period of time, and you want to store them really fast, much faster than RAM. So here, RAM is just a giant block of data storage, you know, four gigabytes or whatever you have of RAM, and you could put anything anywhere, but when your program runs, it gets a region of memory assigned to your program by the operating system, and that region is then subdivided into other regions like this, uh, code in the text section, a heap, stack, and data, um, by the loader that loads your program. So when you have data, you can have static data, which is not allowed to change while the program is running, and you can also have global data, which is available to any part of the program. And uh, so code are the instructions that, that give the uh, program a command, give the, give the processing unit a command, like add something, compare something, move some data from one place to another. The heap is a region of memory that you can dynamically allocate. So if you have something coming in that you have to store somewhere and process, and then you're done with it. Like, for example, if you process network traffic like you're a browser, and you'll load data for a big image and write it on the screen, you'll load some of the data, process it, and then you're done with it. Then you deallocate it and reuse that memory again to load the next bit of data, that sort of thing. That's what goes on the heap. Anything you're going to store for a brief period of time that's too big to fit in some other place like a register. And the stack is where you have local variables and parameters or functions. The most important function of the stack, it is your breadcrumbs to find your way back to the parent program and ultimately to the operating system. It's how you find your way back from where you are because you're at a routine within a routine within a routine, like 30 or 60 levels deep typically. And when you're done processing one routine, you want to quit doing that and go back to the parent routine and uh, process code up there. And the stack is how you organize all that. Variables on the stack are only meaningful while you're running that one routine, and when you return, that memory is uh, returned for reuse. The data may remain for a while 
just as a remnant, but it's no longer intended to be used anymore. And so here's instructions. In assembly language, they look like this. You have a mnemonic, which is essentially the verb. The first thing here tells you what the action is happening. And then you have operands. So this will move 42 into ECX, which is one of the registers. Uh, stack is like nesting. Yeah, yeah, you could look at it like that. Yeah, if you if you think about it, if I'm, I launch Microsoft Word, then I want to save a file, so I hit File Save. It opens the Save dialog. Then it opens some dialog to navigate through the folders. You know, so I'm routine, subroutine, subroutine, subroutine. That's what it is. And so the stack is how you keep track of all that. They each have their own stack frame, and when you return from one, it finds a return address on the stack frame, which takes it to the one above it. And it remembers where it left off and picks up where it left off in the one above it. Yeah, you could see it. As, you could see it as nesting. Nesting parentheses are another way to look at it. All right, so move ECX will just, um, this is the part where you move something into ECX. That is this 8 bits, B9. That's the binary machine language for move ECX. And then you follow it by the value to move in. So it takes five bytes to do this. Move ECX, and this is the number to put in ECX, 42000, because we're a 32-bit processor, so an immediate constant like 42 is always 32 bits long. That's, so that's, those five bytes are the binary that encodes this assembly language command. All right, and so there's the game, move, desti mnemonic, destination, source. That's what you got. This is, by the way, the Intel format, where you put the destination on the left and the source on the right, AT&T reverses them, just to make sure everybody's always good and confused. So whenever I look at a bunch of assembly code, I look for an immediate value like this. Because if you see a number like 1 or 10 or 42, that has to be the source. You cannot move anything into a number. You must be moving the number into something. So this must be the source wherever you see an immediate value. All right. So let's take a look at some cahoots, which I should have open in one of my windows here. And here they are. So this is 4A. All right. My cahoot is loading. And it's showing the questions. Good. And... So I thought it's a little bit over scanned. All right. Did AT&T make hardware? Uh, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know if they ever made computers. I know they made phones and they designed C. I guess they must have made hardware, but I'm not sure. Yeah. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds. So what part of that instruction is the mnemonic? It's move. The question up there is, is Linux still safe for malware? And in practice, yes, in the sense there is malware for Linux, but it's very rare. And you're not likely to get it by browsing the web or something. So 
I think in practice it's a whole lot safer than Windows. All right, let's move. All right, what language does the processor use? The only thing the processor knows is machine code. All this other stuff has to be converted to machine code before it can run. Alright, what utility converts a high-level language into an executable file? <clears throat> Yep, a compiler. Good. All right. What's the most common type of assembly language in malware? x86 is the most common uh, just because it runs on both x86 and x64 and that's the most common hardware. All right. All right. So where are the local variables? Yeah, they're on the stack. You, they really only exist for use while you're in the routine, and when you return, they're deallocated essentially and gone. All right, I don't know who that is. I don't. Oh, I think I know who that is. At least that looks like a abbreviation of a normal student's name. My grader may be able to figure it out. All right. All right. So let's go back to the slides. We are about 630. Good. We're on track here. Yeah, that's you, CCAP. Yeah, good. Good. Yeah, I didn't see you for a while. Good. All right. So Big Indian is the way you normally write numbers. When we write 42, we mean four tens plus two. Now this is hexadecimal, so it's actually four sixteens plus two, but 32, for example, we mean three tens plus two. So normal numbers, you put the most important number on the left, the biggest one, but little endian. Uh, so if you wrote this big endian, it would be like this. You would have none of these things and none of these, and the biggest thing would be four times 16 plus two. And this would be the number 256s and so on. Um, but little endian is something to give you a headache. Um, yeah, well, I'm glad you're back. Ah, you had COVID. Ah, that's no good. Anyway, little, this is this is evil. Now, if you were to make it really big endian, it would be 240000. But the way little endian actually works is each byte is big endian, and the order of bytes is little endian. So this monstrosity is not in order at all. This is the number of 16s. This is the number of 1s, this is the number of 256s, this is the number of 16 times 256, and so on. It's enough to give you a headache. Anyway, that's what it is. The bytes are in little Indian order, with the least significant byte first. That's what it is. And just to make it worse, networking data uses five, um, uses big ending. And numbers are little Indian. 
So you, a lot of the time you're worried about which way it is and converting it from one to another. So IP addresses, like the loopback address, 127.0.0.1, that is 7F.0.0.1, and that's sent over the network in that order. You have to send the first octet first. You can't send them backwards or it'll misunderstand the address. But it's stored in RAM the other way. So that, that's just a little bit of cruelty. All right. So here's immediate values, operands. You can have an immediate number like 0x42. Uh, that's a hexadecimal number. That's what the 0x means, 42. So it's 4 times 16 plus 2. Registers, EAX, EBX, and ECX, those are the little memory locations on the processor. And you can have memory addresses in main memory, which is denoted with brackets. You put square brackets and then the address. So here's some examples. Oh, here's the registers. These are the general purpose registers. You have A, B, C, and D, but they're all EAX, EBX, because A, B, and C, and T were 8-bit registers. And I think AX was the 16 and EAX was the 32. But anyway, that's what they are. Then you have the base pointer and the stack pointer, EBP and ESP. That is the bottom and top of the current stack frame for that low storage of local variables. Then you have ESI, uh, which is just an index you can use for, um, for general purpose, really. And then there's flags and the instruction pointer. The flags, um, we're going to use indirectly. You don't usually refer to them directly. And the instruction pointer is super important, of course. That is the address of the next instruction to be executed. So if you manage to gain control of the instruction pointer, you can take control of the computer. All right. So that's what they say here. Um, all right. They're all 32 bits on a 32-bit processor. Um, and you can refer to small pieces of them as 16 or 8 bits if you want to move just 8 bits at a time, which is not something you normally do unless you're trying to run really old programs that were written for 16 or 8-bit things, or unless you're trying to write shellcode, special kinds of malware, where you have a desire to avoid having any zero bytes. Anyway, so if the EAX register is here, which is 32 bits, but you could refer to the lower 16 bits as AX, or even to 8-bit pieces of it as A high and A low, if you wanted to move just 8 bits of something at a time. But that's not something normal programs do. <coughs> All right, so general registers could be used for anything. Um, they just store whatever data you're working on. If you want to do multiplication and division, they use EAX and EDX in a special way, but most of the time they're interchangeable. All right, uh, one thing that is a tradition is that EAX will contain the return value for a function call. In C, every time you return from something, there's a value, and it's true of most other languages too. And you put that in EAX. So E flags has got all these flags. The bits means things. Set one or cleared zero. Um, so the flags have things like whether the last result was zero, whether you added something and it got too big and you had to carry a one, whether the result was negative or not and the trap flag used for hardware uh, breakpoints, which we'll talk about later. So like I say, these are important to us, but you don't normally look at them one by one in here. You just look at uh, things like whether the last result was zero or not with a command like jump zero or jump not zero. The EIP is the memory address that the next instruction to be executed. This is how the process keeps track of what it's doing. If the EIP is altered, the program moves to a different line of code and does something different other than what the developer intended. That's what buffer overflows do. Buffer overflows are vulnerabilities in a program which can be exploited to alter the EIP in the most common case and therefore redirect code to execute different commands than the developer intended. All right, so here's a few instructions. The most common one is move. Move source to destination. You just move the data from one place to another. And by the way, it's really, all right, that's what it is. All right, so um, that's the game. Indirect addressing means that if you put square brackets around one of these, it becomes a memory address. And whatever's inside here determines the address. You could put an immediate constant in here, or you could put a register in there like EBX. And then it will take EBX and interpret that 32-bit value as an, a memory address and refer to that memory location. So move EBX to EAX. We'll take whatever's in EBX and put it in EAX. Move 42 into EAX. We'll take the immediate number 42 and put it in there. This will take 
this location, 4037C4, a RAM location, and look up whatever data is stored at the 32 bits beginning at that RAM location and put it in EAX. This will take whatever is in EBX, interpreted as a RAM location, read the 32 bits beginning at that location, and put it in EAX. And this is a construction you'll see a lot, EBX plus ESI times 4. Another thing to give you a headache is the bytes are numbered one by one, each byte containing 8 bits, but they're used 32 bits at a time. So that's why I said you don't just go to this location ending in C4 and put that data in EAX. You take C4, C5, C6, and C7, which together are 32 bits, and you move all that data into EAX. So typically, when you're copying a whole range of data from one location to another, which is a very common operation, you have this kind of construction. You move 32 bits starting at one location, then you jump ahead by 4 and move the next 32 bits and the next 32 bits. So EBX plus ESI times 4 is the kind of construction you'll see a lot to move a whole block of data. And then you have a loop that increments ESI. Load effective address is one of the screwier ones. You will, if this was a move, it would take the location EBX plus 8 and put the contents of that memory in EAX. But because it's load effective address, it just puts EBX plus 8 into EAX. I don't know why you can't do this with move. It would have seemed to me to make a lot more sense for it to be done with the move, but for some reason they implemented it as load effective address. Then there's compare. We'll compare two values, and the zero flag will be set if they are equal, and it will not be set if they're not equal. So you can do a compare followed by a branch zero or a branch equal to make it a, to perform an if statement. So here I have EAX is zero, and EBX has this number B30040. And so in B30040, I have zero stored there. So at address 48, I've got 20. So if you were to do this command, load effective address EBX plus 8, it would take EBX, add 8, and it would put B30048 in EAX. But if you did a move EAX, EBX plus 8, it would take EBX, add 8, find this memory location, and put 20 in EAX. So they look similar, but they have different results. There's all the mathematics you might want to subtract, add, increment, decrement, multiply, and divide to do any kind of math you might want to do on numbers. Uh, you got NOP to do nothing. Uh, this would seem useless, but it turns out to be very handy for a variety. The reason NOP is there, remember the first command we did was move EAX a commute value. That took five bytes. Some commands have to start on four byte boundaries. You can't start them partway through a group of four bytes. So if you were to have a five byte instruction and the next one has to start on a uh, four byte boundary, then you'd have to fill three bytes with something and that's what NOP is there for. NOP is to fill in the little gaps between the instructions that you're not allowed to use. And you can also make a NOP sled, which is common in attacks. You might have a thousand or ten thousand NOPs in a row just to make a big block of memory so that if I can jump anywhere in that memory, I'll execute my code. It will do NOP, 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 and then the egg, which is my attack. So uh, that's one thing That's one thing attackers use NOPs for. So the stack is where you store local variables, return addresses for flow control, and local memory for, for things you want to store locally. It's last in, first out. So when you push something on the stack, it goes on top. When you pop something off the stack, it takes the last thing you put on first, like a stack of trays in a cafeteria. That's the idea. This is a strange sort of way to do it, but last in, first out is the logical way for the purpose of the stack, which is calling a function within a subroutine. So if I launch Microsoft Word and I launch uh, a document, and then I launch a print statement. When I'm done with the print statement, I want to go back to just one step back. I don't want to go back to the very beginning. I want to undo the most recent call and go back to the function that called this. So the stack is designed for this dream within a dream process of a subroutine calling off another subroutine and another subroutine, and then you return in reverse order. Uh, yeah, that's essentially the same thing as an undo command, exactly. 
if you were to do, be using Microsoft Word and do things and then hit undo, it's like a stack. You wouldn't want to undo the first thing you did. You'd want to undo the last thing you did. Exactly. Yeah. So uh, you enter a function with call or enter, and you return with leave or return. When you call a function, like printf, um, that function typically do one thing. When you enter the function, there is always a prologue. And when you're done, there's an epilogue. The prologue are instructions that prepare the stack and the registers. It reserves memory for the stack needed in this function and stores the register values so it knows how to return. That's the prologue. Then when you're done, it restores the stack to its original state and returns to the calling program so it can pick up where it left off. All right. Here's the stack frames. So you start, say, with Microsoft Windows here. Then you launch Word, which is another stack frame. Then in Word, you hit Print. So you call another stack frame, and that's what you've got here. The stack grows up to lower memory. And when you are done printing, you return to Word. And when you close Word, you return to Windows. That's what's going on here. And each one of those has their own region of memory. Uh, so you can have stack frames stacked up as deep as you have called functions within a function. All right, so in the stack frame, you will have a bunch of local variables, and then you will have the old extended base pointer and then a return address. So if you were to have a variable that was a string with room for like 10 bytes, and you were able to put in more than 10 characters, you could have a buffer overflow and get down here and change the return address so that when it tried to return from that function, it would go to the wrong address, and that's how you take over the box. All right, test compares two values, and it sets the zero flag if they are the same. Um, and compare, well, compare sets them if they're equal. Test, you know, I'm a little confused, but I think test might only do it if they're zero, not if they're equal. Yeah. I'm a little confused about this one. I might have to check it up. Test it. I think they're both just seeing if they're equal. I don't think they're seeing if it's zero. But anyway, um, I might look that up later. I normally have used compare. I don't think I've ever used test. Anyway, here's branching. Jump, jump zero, jump not zero. That's obvious. If the last thing was produced a result of zero, you'd, then this will be true, and you'll go to that location. If it didn't produce zero, this will be false, and you'll just go to the next instruction. This is the opposite. You jump if it's not zero. You don't jump if it is zero. So every C program has got a main function like this, a main, which is how you enter, and then it has an argument count and an array of argument values. That's the normal way you enter. So this is a C program. All the, all the command line commands you see in Unix or Linux are written in C. So copy, foo to bar, will copy the program foo to the cop program bar. It has three arguments. The first one is cp, the command itself, then foo, and then bar. I would think it would set flag to one value, equals, equals, value, equals, true. Uh, no, it does not do that. If they're equal, you have zero. That's what, Yes, it's not, it's not what you would think. Yeah, you're right. Anyway, so that's an example of the uh, way it's laid out in C. All right, let's try another Kahoot. 4B, we're done with 4A, and we're going to do 4B.
Give it a few more seconds. And put a little mark on my screen. There. All right. All right, so what does that instruction do? That's it. The square brackets mean it takes the EBX, interprets it as an address, and loads the contents of RAM at that location and puts it in EAX. All right. What command retrieves data from RAM? This one, just like the last one, it gets something in the location pointed to by EAX and puts it in EBX. This one does not retrieve data from RAM. It just calculates EDX plus 6, plus 16. And this pushes data onto the stack from a register, not touching RAM. And this moves from one register to another without touching RAM. All right, what command changes the size of the stack? push adds more to the stack just putting like putting one more tray in the cafeteria thing that springs down that makes the stack bigger by adding more data to it all right what instructions repeated many times in a buffer overflow attack Yep, that's it. Knop. You make a knop sled with many knops in a row. All right. What command retrieves data from the stack? All right, that's pop. The opposite of push. All right. All right. All right. I don't know who these people are. I know who that is. Good. All right. So let me stop this recording.